join me in welcoming Martin McDonough, Colin Farrell. Ten years of the plays, I was in a position, I guess, to 
get a short film made. Um, and then was writing, I think, this and maybe even Seven Psychopaths at the same time. Um, and I remember uh, it was also almost a choice between which one to, to go with first. And I think luckily I made the right, <laughs> right decision. Um, but um, but yeah, no, it was it, it wasn't a means to an end. It was it was evolution, I guess. You, you won an Oscar for that show. It's like, the first thing you directed. It was a weak year. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Colin, what do you remember about the first time you read the script for In Bruges? Do you remember how it came to you and what your response was? Uh, yeah, I thought it was extraordinary. I, um, I thought it was like, of course, nothing else I had ever read because it simply wasn't. It wasn't used even just a perspective. It was kind of a fact. His voice is so <coughs> unique and the dialogue was so um, rapid fire and humorous, but beneath the humor was this kind of desire to unearth uh, the questions that exist around the hardships that we all experience in life, the hardships of friendship, the regrets of the past, the loss of love, you lost your missus, I didn't know who I was, Ray, the guilt and the shame that he felt, uh, the depression that he was living in. So it was, yeah, I, and then I tried to get him not to cast me. <coughs> I asked him, to, I said to him, look, I come with a good bit of baggage, um, and I would hate for people to come into this the theater to see this film or to stay away from it even because of a relationship that they may have with me and you know the press and all that stuff. And I had gone through some public stuff within a year, but a year before read the script. So I kind of, I really did, but he didn't. He gave me very little attention as he's done ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't listen to me, thankfully. So I was I just, him. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then began the process of, I couldn't imagine, I, I, any time I've read uh, what I feel like is an extraordinary and original and almost contra in a contradictory fashion, grounded in the real world, but otherworldly as well, piece of writing. And Martin's work is, is like that as well. I mean, that's a very recognizable world and there were very few sets built and we leaned into the beauty of the nature that was all around. But there is something else at play. There's something otherworldly that we still recognize as ours, but I suppose the simplest word is, and it's thrown around a lot, is heightened. But Jorgos Lanthimos as well, similarly, when he and Athenas Philippou, and I read The Lobster for the first time, I had the reaction of, how in God's name do you ever inhabit this like it's normal? <laughs> Any of it. It's, yeah. so, it's so unusual. And yet, somehow, I recognize myself, the people I know, the people I love, the very essence of humanity at the center of it all. I'm just saying Lobster, but how do you make this normal? And so what this fellow does is he gives you three weeks. He gets the cast together for three weeks, and you, you sit in a room, and there's a coffee machine in the corner, and there's some granola bars, and, uh, and a piece of chewing gum. And, and that, was, that was after the success of Bruges. That was my <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but honestly, you have that time. You don't get that in the film very often. You know that time, and I certainly need it, so that I can almost normalize, which is by its very essence, incredibly, incredibly a abnormal, anormal, original writing. Yeah, I mean, I find it so crazy that films don't have that rehearsal period because to me it seems like the most cost-effective way of taking, you know, you don't have a crew of people all waiting around while you're figuring things out, right? It's, yeah, I don't understand it either. It's the cheapest thing you can do. Um, I guess it's about schedules and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, it depends on who you're working with. Like, I remember um, after Bruges, I said, right, that's it. That's the only way to do it. It's the only way to do it. It sounds so much yeah. in the rehearsal room and save so much time and money, obviously, thereby, and, and all that. And then I went uh, working with Paul Wintergrass, and, he, and he, uh, his whole modus operandi was completely and utterly different. He'd write as he, he as he would, so he, he'd spend the whole morning going at something, and he said, no, no, it's not right. Then he said, we should, actually, we should be over there. And the whole thing would move over there, and he'd write four pages of dialogue. So he'd, there, there you go, have a go at that. <laughs> and uh, it was the most, completely different, so like everybody has their own creative process, it's a bit like acting as well, you know, yeah. you just have to, it's, it's a fantastic thing that how different people come I love that part of it. Yeah, come to this, to, you know, their particular place, yeah. by different routes. I won't give, like, even after the years I've been asked, you know, by people that you're about to start working with, uh, 
and it's usually the directors would ask you, do you like to rehearse or not rehearse? And I, I will not give an answer to that. I go, whatever you want to do, that's what we'll do. Because it just, it, I think that's the, you, you, you do lean into the director. And I go, I mean, if I read, but I don't have a preference because just magic stuff comes up and you don't prepare as well somehow. But I do, with, with certain material, I, I tell you, uh, yeah, his stuff, it just begs you to just dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and familiarise and familiarise. And it doesn't mean that we arrived on the set and there was no conversations and we knew exactly what we were doing. It just means you, I think you said it once, the, that you, you, you know you don't have to go down that cul-de-sac. And you know you don't have to go down that cul-de-sac. Yeah, and there's other ones waiting for you. You know, There's other layers. And also I think Martin's, Martin's um, writing is particularly lyrical, it's particularly musical. And so uh, the rhythm of the lines is very important. And like from the very beginning, I remember uh, you said something like, look, if there's three dots, you know, if there's a sentence and it, there's three dots, it's kind of three pauses. It's not, it's, it, or not three pauses, but the length of three dots is the pause or something like that. And the reason is, it's not in any way a straight jacket. But like I have to say, because maybe of the, the, the texture of the language and because I, 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 I go out to the west of Ireland an awful lot and, and the language is kind of, well, it's Dublin language here, I guess, uh, in Bruges. And that even was an interesting one because it was originally supposed to be two cockneys, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, two London guys. Um, but we didn't have to change much at all. There was practically nothing. It was amazing. And like, that's, that's a long story anyway about you know, <laughs> Dublin and, and it was kind of in a semi-British city for a long time anyway. So Dublin speak is quite fit, fit quite easy. Very little we had to change when, when, when the characters were Irish. But, it's the nature of Martin's writing in terms of the way it is in the plays, the way it is in, in the movies. There's a rhythm to it. And it's just so pleasing when you're reading the script. You just get the script and it's like, oh, you're like on that train, you know, going between Water and Wexford because, the, because there's a rhythm to it. So the rehearsal about how to explore that is different if really all you need to do is express the thought. You know, um, and I think maybe in your career, Chris, I think you in some way you, you don't want you want to rely less on that but I've always found it one of the most beautiful parts of your writing is that it's the actual language it's such a pleasure to to hear the music of it yeah absolutely and in, in terms of the you know planning Martin I talked to your cinematographer on Banshees and he was telling me you know you guys storyboarded everything pretty strictly now a lot of people you know some directors think oh if you storyboard too much it's going to kind of freeze you up or something but I mean is there a sense where it's actually sort of similar to this rehearsal idea? Is it more liberating to have that plan going in and you can actually be more flexible? Um, yeah, I think so. For me, it's it's. I still, each time, I'm thinking of myself as a first-time filmmaker in, in lots of ways because I didn't do film school or any of that. So I need some kind of crutch to know that there's a way, how, how do you get through the, a scene in six shots or something? Um, that can change on the day, obviously. But to, to know that if you've got those six, you have the scene, that's uh, is, is useful for me, I think. But also, if you're storyboarding the whole thing, when you go from one scene to another, you, you, you can see what kind of visual references can, can do that. You know, if one scene takes place in front of a window, for instance, the next scene you, you'll think about entering that way. Um, so so it, it's, it's that kind of stuff. I don't write too many visual elements into a script. It's pretty much just the character and the dialogue and, and what happens. But um, that, for me, is the first time I, I think of the, in the, each image um, on its own. He, story, he storyboards. When you storyboard, you start to see the film. Normal chatting. That's the next film. <laughs> when you storyboard. <laughs> <laughs> do you start seeing the film clearer than when you write? Because obviously when you write, you do see a certain amount of clarity or maybe blocking and all that kind of stuff when you storyboard as well. Yeah, it's, level. it's the first time to actually see images, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. I, I think I've heard all of the characters on all the conversations up yeah. until that point, but I haven't yeah. seen anything that happens up until this point. Wow, really? Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> No, that you wouldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. that's what, that's it. You know, watching the movie tonight on the big screen, I think amazingly it was the first time I ever noticed, and I felt stupid for not noticing because you basically tip it off with the touch of evil. Uh, 
homage, you know, that, that whole thing with Brendan on the phone with, with Ray Fine, I think is all done in one unbroken take. Right? Yeah, five, five minutes. Five so, minutes which, which is brilliant, a, brilliant performance. Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was very funny because Ray Fines is just a gent through and through. Uh, he came over from London to Bruges to be on the other end of that phone call. Now, this was a phone call. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a degree of his professionalism and, and just his kind of collaborative willingness to go to the very end if we needed to talk about it or if we had to have to chat. He was there in the next room. It was like amazing. Yeah, that, but I, that, that was kind of fun, five or six minutes worth. And you kind of think it's kind of challenge. I, I think you were just loving it. And I was loving it. Uh, and then with Rafe on the other side, it just became a bit of a dance, really, with an unseen partner. Um, so yeah, it's, that's the kind of stuff I think increasingly that Mark's um, leaving space for, I think. Again, a kind of a, cin a cinematic decision, purely cinematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe in, in the next film, I think there might be sort of less of those kind of moments, sort of bravura, bravura whatever that is, and then I think in the next one, is everyone staying for the next one? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or a new successor? Who has this one? Okay, that's good. Plug <laughs> <laughs> <Hope> your ears. Spoilers, <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, but I think there's less, less of that uh, overtly cinematic language and more room for acting. Oh, I'm not more, just differently. Yeah. So it's interesting development. It's more of a your head than us. We go anywhere, Mark. <laughs> no, you know what I mean. It really is the word that you uh, that you fashion. Sorry, directorially is always fascinating. Yeah, it's very hard not to keep thinking of the next movie and trying not to talk about it. But uh, no, it's always, it, there's always a kind of an exp exploration, and I wouldn't change that five minute conversation phone thing for the world either. You didn't oh, feel, no, no, they didn't feel showy or, or that we were no, trying to prove really upon really you, I think. Yeah, and really, um, when you're watching it, I don't think it seems like an unbroken take. Um, no, I mean, I've seen the movie four times, and Sam was the first time I realized it. Huh? Oh, that's great. That's, that's, that's great. cinematic aficionado, touch me, you know, you know the reference to the points. <laughs> 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 it's not a like, <laughs> long five minutes for me. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary. Was, you know, it, it, it owes, of course, to the simple fact of the writing being what it was, the ownership of a character and, and the in inhabiting of the character that Brendan was at at that stage, and allowing it to play. I, I, I yeah, of course, I remember very clearly. Jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of ownership of character, you're talking about banshees. Something that struck me as really interesting about that movie is, and I, I, mean, I, don't, I won't give any spoilers for people who are seeing it for the first time, but. There is this idea that Brendan's character finds Colin's character boring, and you have to get across why both why Brendan's character would consider Colin's character boring without Colin's character boring the audience. Now, is that something? Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's still only a seven. Mine was a nine. <laughs> It is, how do you take someone so obviously charismatic and make them go? <laughs> 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 the way you play this guy. I mean, what, you know, to me it seems like it would be a really... No, hold his feet to the flame, just yeah, <laughs> 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 But, uh, <laughs> well, it's only Brendan's character's opinion, this is all in the first five minutes, you're like, uh, opinion that he's, he's that way. I, I don't think he's boring at all. With no, he's not. It's everyone, everyone needs the, the town or the island without giving them away. Everywhere, the world, this city, this room, the line at Star Wars. People make micro judgments, and everyone needs to classify someone as something. There has to be the jester, there has to be the prince, there has to be the cl clowns that say the jester, not, no, it's not. There has to be the king. And, and, you know, there's all these sad things, these archetypes that we live within. 
That's my long-winded way of saying that my character isn't dull <laughs> and wasn't dull, but he's not, look, he's not exactly, he's not, you'll, you'll see he's not as cultured and he's not as worldly. And he's probably not as interesting <laughs> as, this, <laughs> as this man, but there's an integrity to him. That's the thing, I suppose that's the thing, but is that if you write characters with integrity and if you write them with honesty, and if you have, you know, and I wouldn't suggest this be me, but if you have the right actor, they could be there in stillness, in stillness, Without dialogue, you know. I mean, I think of um, I think of Sam Morton, the film that she did with Sean Penn, Sweet um, Sweet Low Down. Sweet Low Down. You know, and and of course, not a word of dialogue. And one of the most interesting, most beautiful, most elaborate, most articulate characters in film that I can remember. You know, so so look, the writing was it was everyone else. It was on everyone else really how the island referred to him, and. Even his own sister, a little bit perhaps, but um, but I didn't find him dull. No, he wasn't dull, and like I, I don't want to go into saying what he was because we, we, it's too early. You, you, you haven't seen it yet. Um, but I think that the idea of of a prison through which somebody is viewed is amazing, uh, and that and that people can switch perspective where the same action appears to be from being one positive thing it appears to be a completely negative thing. Uh, just all by shifting the prison a little bit. And suddenly, you know, you can see it in a, te in a, in a, in a movie theater. Uh, if somebody takes against it and finds something awkward about the movie, it can, you know, it can spread like COVID-19, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it can go through the place where if somebody it, it stops, it not only doesn't laugh, but actively sort of with their, their grunting, you know, anti-laughs. Or if you're sitting at home and you're watching it with somebody like, for example, my wife, <laughs> and she's not laughing. It's very difficult to involve yourself in the hilarity of what's going on. <laughs> I do it over the bits, but it's, it's very hard to watch this slapstick comedy. Without feeling this is stupid, what are you laughing at? <laughs> but in, other, in other words, people, we are herd animals, you know, and it might be something to have a think about, uh, you know, because when the great things hopefully that you go away with from Banshees is a discussion. Um, and it, that is one of the things that, is, that we do go with the flow um, because we are herd animals. And so if somebody is classified as dull, suddenly yeah. that becomes the truth if it's said at the right time by the right person. And if somebody is extraordinarily, like if Yates writes about the fisherman which he did and talks about the simplicity of honest toil and how the communion with the sea and the elements is basic uh, sophistication at a kind of a, a wisdom at a profound level. That's how you see that fisherman. So, yeah, that's. I think it's about prisms and per perception, really, and actually naming people, naming people, and naming. Um, you know, it's sometimes defining people with names uh, can be so instrumental. It can be so creative and so destructive. Did you guys find anything challenging about playing these two characters who are, you know, fr it's basically a deteriorating friendship, and the two of you are ob obviously very fond of each other. I mean, did you have to do anything coming into this? Were you thinking, you know, oh, maybe we shouldn't shouldn't hang out during this or talk during this, or you know, what was your? No, there was a thought. I was I was a little bit nervous um, when I read the script because I thought, I know how deep Brendan goes. I know the heft with which he launches the shovel to the center of his curiosity. Um, and so I knew, so when we met, I said, look, do you want, I thought maybe he'd want a bit of space. Because this is, this is not a spoiler, alert, because it, as Martin said, the first couple of minutes, bless you, the first couple of minutes, <laughs> <laughs> <it> matters. <laughs> the first we always had good manners, Colin, <laughs> <laughs> The first couple of minutes of the film, the line, you know, this fellow might not want to be a friend anymore. And that's it. So there's, you don't get really an exploration of what it was to be together, to share joy, to you know have that com communion. And so I thought, well, maybe maybe he'll want a bit of space. And if he does, that's grand. I totally respect that. And I've worked with actors that do want a bit more space and do stay closer to their character throughout the day. I've worked with other actors who are off and having a laugh, and then they hear roll sound and they're pumped straight into it. Extraordinary. There's no right, no wrong. And we saw each other. I said, "Listen," he said, "Do you want? Do you think?" And he had the same kind of thought. The two of us looked at each other. We went, "Ah, uh, nah." Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we just we just need to say, if I can say we. And and there's there's a there's a wellspring 
there is a, I mean, I've said that we don't, we don't have much more of a shorthand when we, or didn't when we shot this film as we did on Bruges, because we had a shorthand for some reason, some uh, kind of undefinable reason from my perspective, we had a shorthand from the start, but we come to the work from the same direction. I think certainly for me, to be able to bounce things off him and to be able to have the kind of care and consideration that he exudes as an actor. He's one of the most generous, thoughtful human beings I've ever met anyway. And that generosity and that thoughtfulness, that doesn't get pushed to the side, it doesn't get diluted. If anything, it gets magnified by the creative process. So to be close to that, and to be able to lean into that in between the takes, because the conversations that took place in the three weeks in the rehearsal space, those conversations were a launching point still, as I was saying earlier. It wasn't like we arrived with certainty. It launched us into the next round of conversations and the next round of conversations. But um, the familiarity for me was, was aces. So there was no, there were times when we're doing scenes, as you'll see, and you can imagine which scenes might have been the ones what came into the game during the film. Um, <laughs> but, but hopefully you won't be that bored. But, um, but there, were, there were days when naturally, you know, he'd be at one end of the bar, yeah, yeah. and I'd be at the other end of the bar, and I know he'd be going through the scene, and the last setup and the next setup and staying close to what we were finding was the core of what was happening. And, uh, and I'd be doing the same, you know? And we wouldn't, geez, we wouldn't be saying a word to each other for an hour or two, but there'd be no, there'd be no looks getting thrown. Yeah, I remember going out, know, going out and looking at the sea, particularly yeah, at John yeah, Joseph's pub, yeah. and it just, yeah. you know, it was just savage out there. It was so, so beautiful wow. uh, against the rocks. And the two was about kind of, and it would be one of those scenes that were kind of quite, uh, you know, conflicted, a bit of conflict in them, and just, two was just take the energy off the sea and just stand there and look at it. And we knew that we were both involved in the same thing. Um, and similarly, just like with, with it, some people, like I, I've worked with those people like Tom was talking about, again, we were talking about different phones and, and whether you need the hair or not. Some people need as a process to be right in there all the time, as long as there's integrity about that search yeah. and it's not just posing and throwing shapes for some sort of egotistical reasons. It's, it's phenomenally, you feel privileged to be a part of it, and then you have to up your game in a particular way. But the collaborative process whereby we could kind of bounce stuff off each other uh, and then go back into the ring. Um, and similarly in Bruges, I remember we were I remember you saying to me one day, um, it was I think the one where we were on the swing, uh, talking with the gun and stuff. <laughs> I, I think that's my favourite still from the movie is where I'm pointing a gun at him, telling him not to kill himself. It's, uh, <laughs> or I'll shoot you, basically, is the implication. And, uh, and all that whole thing that plays out, it's just so brilliant. Uh, and then he, he's, he's You're like, going to shoot yourself. No, I know. <laughs> I know, and then I tell you, I robbed the bun, this little baby bun off, and I won't give it back. But I remember we had, we just had a really good day in that, that day in the park during the morning, and then I saw his whole face, Colin's face, uh, completely darkened, and, I, and, and he says, oh, uh, he had to go back in, the scene being shot in the afternoon, was basically where he had to turn, you know, he, he was a child killer. And, I mean, he had been a child killer when he was trying to kill himself, obviously that part was part of the morning. But we come through it where there was a bit of levity and it was kind of, we were able to have a laugh. And we were on these swings, it was silly. Uh, and I, I saw his whole face kind of darker. And I thought, oh, I have to go back into the face. And it was the first time I realized how much um, kind of, you know, pain it was inhabiting that guilt within the film for him. But that, it was a good release for us both to be able to kind of share those moments Without feeling that we're crossing the line. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, nature took care of a lot of the force. The kind of the force that was that was happening between the islanders and between your character, and my character in the film, was not only matched, of course, but was transcended by the crashing of the waves off that coastline. Yeah. Thing, where you built the, the the bar that you'll see in the next film, John Joe's bar, where a lot of the, of course, I mean, the two cornerstones of Irish community back then were, were the church and the the pub, you know, and. Um, where you built that. I mean, the first time you saw him the first time after seeing where the bar was built, and it was so lovely, Brendan went up and shook Martin's hand and said, congratulations. I'm like, 
some weird but beautiful and really appropriate. He'd say congratulations to you for choosing that location. So brave. It was yeah. so brave, it really was. It was so God, it was the end oh, of the oh, world. Oh, <laughs> no, no, the end of the world, it was, it was extraordinary. Yeah. And it fed into everything that we did. It really did, man, it fed into everything. Knowing that was outside, not just as actors, but everyone living there, knowing that that's what you step out into, yeah. and that's what you come in away from to get shelter from at the same time. It was extraordinary. But then we'd stop the scene sometimes because it was a perfect sunset. Okay. Let's go to watch it. Oh. Down. The whole crew is just looking at the, the, the horizon and go back in. Yeah, I minutes. sent Kerry a picture of that. Uh, Kerry Condon, who plays Sharon in the film next one. I sent Kerry a picture of that today because I've been lathering on about it for a while. Yeah. Boom, picture, she's there. And every, nearly every day, and we shot the book for a lot around the time of the sunset. The crew, you know, 40 or 50 people, the cast of the crew, would just wander out the door of the pub <laughs> and you just take five minutes. And you know, as you said, time is a big concern on these things. And it wasn't five minutes because the camera broke. It was five minutes because the sun was just heading towards the horizon as it does and the sky just changed character every day. It was equally beautiful each time we saw it, but yeah, it's really nice. uh, it's feeding us. Yeah, it really was. It was beautiful. It was such a special time. Well, I want to wrap this up so we can watch Banshees, but... Oh, yeah, are, sorry, yeah. But I want to thank you guys. They're both beautiful movies. I really appreciate you coming out and taking the time to talk to us. Yeah. Yeah.